he has spoken on the topics faith, family and freedom in Cuba, Belgium, Brazil, Congo, UK and all over the USA to crowds from 14 to 40,000. International Leadership Speaker, Trainer and Coach Author of Learn to Raw Leadership, Attitude Hack, Live a More Excellent Life, 5 Battle Strategies of a Victorious Warrior. 2021 President's Lifetime Achievement Award Recipient. Founding Partner of the John Maxwell Team. Toastmaster International Speech Competition Semi-Finalist. Founder of Tell It Like It Is TV, ThatGuyRocks.com and ThatGuySpeaks.com. Creator of Story Power TV, Transforming Grace TV, and Leading Leaders Podcast. Producer of four TV programs and podcasts for Liftable TV and World Trumpet Television as well as multiple social media channels. Please help me welcome J. Lauren Norris. You know, I grew up redneck in a small town in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And one of the phrases we heard on a regular basis was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Problem was, there were a whole lot of things that were broke. In fact, my uncle was infamous for saying, my truck's held together with baling wire and duct tape. And he wasn't kidding, most of the seat was made of duct tape and half of the fenders on that old truck were held on by baling wire. And he carried a spool of baling wire in the back of his truck just in case something else tried to fall off. As a leader, there are a whole lot of relationships, employees, team members, collaborators, customers, vendors, where your relationship is kind of held together by duct tape and baling wire. But you're going to have to troubleshoot those problems and figure out what really is the problem before you can solve them. And that's what I want to talk about in this episode of Leading Leaders. Subscribe now for our extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom. I'm J. Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast. And yes, I do often have to take my own advice, especially after the fact. Uh, posthumous events, those that have gone by and now we're looking back on them going, what happened, what went right, what went wrong? And the recap, the autopsy of an event, the autopsy of a relationship or a customer sale. It's sometimes it's called a debrief, an exit interview. As someone is leaving the company, you ask them all those questions about why did they leave? Why didn't they stay? Why are they ready to go? What are they moving on to next? What could you have done to keep them on the team? Sometimes as they're on the way out the door, you're like, I am so glad they're leaving. But hey, I want them to know why they're leaving. All of these are different forms of troubleshooting. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but it, it really is troubleshooting when you have an exit interview with an employee. When you lose a customer and you ask them, hey, I'm not going to try to fight to win back your business and, and you know corrupt whatever you've got going on with the new person, but I would like to know what we could have done better. That sometimes called a customer service survey, a follow-up survey. And depending on the size of your company or organization and what you offer, that may be a regular part, like a poll that you take of all of your customers, new on board and those that are moving on to something else. Because you cannot solve problems that you cannot identify and you cannot manage what you do not measure. You've got to keep stats on all of these things. But you also have to know that, like Occam Razor says, to start with the simple thing. The most likely problem is most likely the problem for a reason. It's most likely because everybody's experienced that at some point and seems to be the first thing. And it's kind of like, I know you've heard it a billion times. Whatever you lost is always in the last place you look for it. That's an Occam Razor kind of a thought. Why? Well, because you stopped looking for it when you found it. Of course, it was in the last place you looked. You don't find your keys and go, oh, there's my keys. Let me keep looking for my keys because that just wouldn't make any sense. And yet we tend to do that in our human relationships as leaders. We find out what the problem is. We identify the problem. We look at it and go, oh, yeah. And then we continue on in the relationship without solving that problem. We're still looking for something else to go right when all the things that have gone wrong now have a source. Like John Maxwell said, if Bob has a problem with Tony and Bob has a problem with Sue and Bob has a problem with Carol, Bob might be the problem. Occam's razor. 
The simplest solution is the most likely solution. Why? Well, because things tend to break over time because everything decays, doesn't get better. And there are things in your life, in your leadership, in your relationships, in the systems that are designed to break first. Right? You may not know this, but in the late 60s and early 70s, which the car that I first drove was a 1967 Chevy Impala. That was my high school car of record. I had a couple of others. They didn't really count. They only lasted a couple of weeks. But the one I drove most of my high school career was a 67 Chevy Impala. That car was all metal. It probably weighed 50,000 pounds. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But it was heavy. The bumpers were steel with no rubber covers. The fenders, steel with no rubber covers. And if you bumped into something, the something you bumped into knew it. My master cylinder went out one day and I ran it into a brick wall to stop it because I had seven people in the car. Yeah, seven people in a two-door. It was a big car. But I went up the hill and that wouldn't slow it down. And I started down the hill and that didn't slow it down. And I downshifted all three gears and got it in first gear. We finally got it down to about 15 miles an hour. And then I saw a brick wall at the back of a parking lot facing uphill. I thought if I can just get to that, I can come to a complete stop and we can fix it tomorrow. But I don't want to be cruising down the road where there are other people in front of me. And so we intentionally ran into a brick wall to stop this old car. Well, in the late 80s, they decided that cars that are all steel like that with a steel frame from bumper to bumper, not only are they heavy when it comes to, you know, coping with things like gas mileage, but they are also very damaging. And so they created crumple zones. Now, if you've been in cars in the last couple of years, if you did to stop what I did to stop in my 67 Impala, you would have got hit in the face with an airbag and probably in your ear as well and one around your feet because cars now are built like pillows. So if you bump into a big bug in Texas, your airbag just might go off. But if you bump into a brick wall to stop, it's definitely going to go off. Here's what's worse. That steel bumper of mine actually poked a hole in a couple of the bricks. Didn't matter, it was around the dumpster and they tore it all down later anyway, but it did damage to the bricks. These days, the crumple zone in your car would cost you about $500 to fix if you rolled into a brick wall at 10 or 12 miles an hour. That's a solution that was created to overcome a problem of, hmm, I'm not sure what problem it solved, but here's what I do know though. There's been a whole lot more money made by body shops and auto parts salespeople because try this sometime. Just take your bumper cover off and realize how many vital organs of your car, like your car's ECM, your windshield washer bottle, the cooling system that's attached to your radiator, are hiding behind that piece of plastic that basically wouldn't stop a baseball pitch by a five-year-old. And it's covering things in your car that if you break them, like running over a deer or an armadillo, it's gonna cost you thousands to get your car back on the road. I'm not sure they were solving a major problem, but they were creating lots of problems that can only be solved by spending a lot of money buying their parts. I don't think that falls in the category of Occam's razor. That calls, falls in the category of um, perhaps overzealous capitalism. <laughs> yeah, they just want to make sure that the cash flow is still coming. And so we'll create a problem and then we'll become the only solution to it. That is not the kind of troubleshooting that I'm talking about as a leader. As a leader, the kind of troubleshooting that you've got to be busy about is the kind of troubleshooting that says, what kind of problem do we have? What created it? What are the symptoms? What are the solutions? How do we fix it? And if you don't take the time to ask those tough questions, chances are you're going to be solving problems way further down the line. Let me give you a good example of my own foolishness. This week, we came home from an out of town all day trip and walked in the house to find it 91 degrees inside the house. 91 inside the house. Oh yeah, we have central heat and air. It wasn't central heat and air or anything. It was off. It was off. The whole system was turned off. And so I went outside and I flipped the breakers. They weren't turned off, but when I flipped them back on, AC unit came back on for 21 seconds and then for 11 seconds 
and then for four seconds, and then off. And it wouldn't stay on. And when it was on and the fan was blowing, it would blow eh, air. But there was obviously a problem. So I did what most people do in the troubleshooting category. I took a 50 second video of exactly what the system was doing. I posted on social media and said, what do y'all think? And 90% of the people responded went, aha, I see this problem. I've seen this problem before. You need to change the capacitor on your compressor. Great, that's great advice. That's exactly what I needed to know. And so we went about the business of finding a capacitor. Someone drove out to our house last night and we changed out the capacitor. And we got exactly the same results we had. In fact, after he changed the capacitor, he looked at the old one and he said, that one doesn't look burned up to me. They're usually swollen. Great. So we didn't fix the problem we did have. We identified that the problem we thought we fixed wasn't actually a problem at all. So now what? So we turned the breakers off, we turned it back on again. He said, you know, it might be this contactor thing here because if I push this button in and hold it, the system runs and the minute I let it off, it goes off. And I said, well, what makes the contactor decide to be open or be closed to work or not work? And we went back to the internet and found some YouTube videos and found some research on it. Turns out that contactor on or off is driven by the thermostat. So we traced the wire to the thermostat, we checked the battery in the thermostat, we turned it on and off, we bypassed the thermostat temporarily and got it to work. Interesting. But the thermostat's not bad. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's reading right. It's giving the proper instructions when we turn it to the off position or the heat position or the fan on position. And yet we still have a problem. What's the problem? So that's when my AC technician climbs up in the attic and realizes that we have about eight gallons of water in the overflow flow pan, pan below the AC coils inside. And then we realize that at some point during the home inspection, because we just bought this home in March, the inspector said, you don't have a proper drain system hooked up to that AC and you're going to have to route something completely out of the house because right now if that pan overflows, it overflows into the ceiling. Well, according to the photographs that I have, the solution to that was to cap off the drain from the pan. So it can't drain into the ceiling. Genius. Where's the water going now? In the pan. Eight gallons of it. That's what we siphoned out of there. Yeah, but there's also another drain that goes out of the house straight from the coils. Well, that's good. That's kind of default one, right? All the condensation goes out of the building. That line has water sensors. So if that line gets blocked up, as is common in Texas, spiders and dirt doppers and wasps like to make their homes in dark, moist places, like your drain line for your AC. And so we had to clean it out and reset those little water meters and connect the system back up. And by the time we got up this morning, it was so cold in the house, my wife was turning the air off and looking for a sweater. Capacitor wasn't bad, contactor wasn't bad, Freon wasn't gone, fan motor wasn't bad. Nope, it was all related to the water sensors and the overflow in the tank. Now, I'm gonna tell you this because it's kind of embarrassing. The house we just moved out of on a regular basis would actually dump water in the floor because we had dirt daubers that were maniacal and we would kill them and we would spray them and they would still build their home in the drain of the AC unit. And on a regular basis, we would be gone for a day and come home at the end of the day and the floor underneath the AC unit would be wet. Thankfully, it was on the first floor and not in the attic and draining through the walls, but it made a heck of a mess in the tile. I should have got a clue from that Occam's razor, simplest solution is the most likely and said, hey, I wonder if the condensation buildup has caused the whole thing to shut itself off. I would have saved myself a whole lot of trouble in two days of waiting on someone to come and replace the capacitor and the investment in said repairs. How often do we as leaders let a problem go or forget that we've solved this problem before and it wasn't that complicated, but we kind of nipped it in the bud. We took care of this problem at an early enough 
part of the cycle or the process. We, we caught the problem with two people not getting along on the team. This last week, I had a chance to work with some high school students, and one of them, 17 years old, has had three promotions since he started his job at 15, two or three, had a couple of raises, a dollar an hour, and he's currently in charge of 17 people. And when we talked about some of his interview skills, I said, how do you reckon you got to be, at your age, proficient enough to lead over a dozen people? That's an uncommon thing unless you're in the military. In fact, most people won't put you in charge of 17 people when you're 17 years old. And he said, I don't know. I said, tell me about your family. Well, he's one of eight. <laughs> that explains a lot. He has four younger siblings. And the ones that he has to take care of are constantly doing what siblings do. Little sibling rivalry, yakking at each other, yelling at each other, starting fights with each other. But as the big brother, He's always been the peacemaker, always been the one to find a resolution, always been the one to find a solution. And the easiest solution is usually the most practical. It's the one you should start with. And so this young man at 17 years old is leading more than a dozen people because he already has the skill set necessary to negotiate. Imagine that. Now think about all those people who grew up as only children. They have such a hard time with the teams that they lead or the people they're responsible to and the ones they're responsible for because they've never been put in the place where survival, if you will, depends on being able to get along with the most difficult people in your life. Siblings. Because they know all your secrets. They probably have read through your diary or your journal and they know your deepest, darkest, hidden secrets that nobody in the world knows. That makes them a very potent enemy. You got on the bad side of your siblings, they know things about you you don't want the world to know and they will threaten to tell the world if you don't play along. Once you've mastered that relationship, if you have a good relationship with your siblings of different ages, I have a coaching client, lives in San Diego, she's one of nine, one of nine, one of the two middle children. She has older and younger siblings. Can you imagine growing up in a house of nine? What your negotiation skills have to look like, how you make peace, how you play one against the other, how you get people to do what you want them to do? It's an art form. And when you become very good at it, you sell billions of dollars in real estate, as she has. Because she's really good at finding the trouble spot. She's really good at troubleshooting the problem in a relationship, the problem in a deal, the problem in an offer because she's had to do it so many times. Now the question for you as, as a leader, have you mastered those skills of troubleshooting? Have you asked yourself a couple of times over, am I looking at the simplest solution first? Have I already jumped ahead and listened to the crowd? Uh, let me throw this in as a caveat. If you're a sibling of a large family and you're also married, there's a really good chance that when you and your spouse have an argument or have a fight, that your siblings are going to take your side. I mean, unless you just have a horrible relationship with them. And sometimes they'll take your side with what they consider to be the wisest advice you've ever heard. And that wise advice might tell you it's time to move on, that you shouldn't be staying in this difficult relationship. I mean, we've known you all your life. This person can't even put up with you for this period of time. Well, what's wrong with them? But when you get advice from a large group of people that is counter to your own intuition, when you get advice from a large group of people and you find out later that the advice of the many wasn't necessarily the best advice. Remember, when I came home to 90 degrees in my house, 91, I posted on social media. There were probably 50 replies of various forms between text messages, emails, and social media, and 90% of them said, it's got to be, it's got to be that one capacitor. Fix that capacitor and you're good to go. All of them were wrong. One out of that entire group of people said, change your filter. No one mentioned, check for a clogged drain pipe or water 
in the pan under the AC unit. It didn't dawn on anybody. So what does that tell me? The masses can be wrong. And it's common that when someone throws an idea out, even when it's wrong, the masses latch on to that and large groups of people on your team, your entire VP structure, everybody in your mid-level management. They may say, well, I don't want to give an idea because I can't take a chance of being wrong, but what they said sounds good to me, so let's go with that. And now you're solving a problem that you don't have while overlooking a problem that you do have because you listen to the masses. Siblings will do that to you. Teams will do that to you. Public consensus will do that to you. But it doesn't necessarily guarantee that what they're doing to you, for you, with you, is productive. It might just be the most common opinion. And you know what they say about opinions and socks. Yeah. If you want to be an effective leader, you need to understand the process of troubleshooting. You need to become very agile at troubleshooting in relationships, in deals, in systems, in programs, in products. You need to know how to look at them for every way from Sunday and find the problem that everybody else is overlooking and ask yourself, is there a simpler way to solve this problem? Is there a solution that I have been ignoring or overlooking? And what if I solved that problem first? Would it solve all the cascading problems that come from it? When you become a master technician at leadership, <clears throat> communication skills, reading people, solving problems in relationships, you're going to find that the leadership lid in your life raises significantly. And if you're not real good at that, find someone for your team who is and delegate that. But don't ignore the most simple, most likely Occam's razor kind of a problem. Deal with that one first and then move up the food chain. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast for Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day. teacher on storytelling and I learned so much um, I'm really gonna have to sit down and go back through everything and I think I might have to have some more coffees with Lauren but uh, it was totally worth my time and I really highly recommend it if you're looking to grow your ministry grow your business uh, grow your career uh, Lauren will serve you well